And welcome back. We're going to continue with a discussion on natural selection uh, as we finish up our discussion on species and then we're going to look at how their populations change and their importance within the ecosystem. Um, so the, the idea of natural selection um, is the concept in which these traits are um, carried on to help a species um, survive and reproduce and we can look at natural selection as a process which occurs in three different ways and we're going to start our discussion with those three different ways. Um, the first one is what we call stabilizing natural selection and this is a fun one that's a Z by the way Z stabilizing. Um, if I can do it without writing a whole lot of words and just put it instead in a graph form I will try to make a beautiful graph. The graph is going to be basically on your y-axis would be your um, the survival rate or the population population and on the bottom is going to be a particular trait okay and it's going to be very general and you'll you'll get the gist of this very quickly okay in stabilizing natural selection if you have some sort of trait you will always have a population in which has a variety of that trait if it's a color you could be on one end where it's very light colored fur and on this end would be the dark and most of your traits fall in the middle okay which is normal and we we talk about this with uh, law of limiting factors with the same kind of idea when we talk about stabilizing natural selection what that means is that the traits on the extreme ends all right on either side are somehow not helping the species survive and what happens is they die out and you lose the species on the ends and your population becomes more homogeneous with the same trait. All right, so you're stabilizing your population. Um, this could be um, example be like birth weight and for humans where if a baby's born um, too small you have a better chance of um, not surviving or sometimes if it's the baby is too big the baby dies during birth because of the size of the baby. Um, so we're looking at stabilizing as trying to create a species which becomes more homogeneous. That's why it's called stabilizing natural selection. And that's the kind you're familiar with. Okay? Let's go to the second one. On your notes, and we call that directional. And with directional, instead of having the ex both extremes eliminated or removed from your population, now you tend to, to move in one direction. So again, if you have your trait with all of the species, okay on that trait directional means one particular half of that trait okay is not beneficial to the species and so you tend to have your species move towards the other trait and we'll talk about this where it may be um, the gray wolf versus a arctic or a gray fox versus an arctic fox where the arctic fo fox is white all right, so you tend to move towards that trait. And that's called directional natural selection. And then we got one more, just for the fun of it. Um, and that's called disruptive. And this, whoops, disruptive. The disruptive natural selection is a little bit different. Now what you have, and for reasons which we'll get to, which sometimes does make a whole lot of sense, but the most common trait part of that trait now becomes the negative and those species are removed from your population and then your population tends to go to two extremes and this happens usually because of a change in your environment something changes or some kind of additional selective pressure uh, like we talked about in the last lecture on the grasses okay or on the small uh, amphipods um, and the fish where it's pushed towards the extremes and what this does is forces two 
distinct populations to form on each side. All right, that's called disruptive. So let me take a look at these again, just to make sure you got the idea. Um, we're going to try to look at it in a different type of graph form here. Okay, and here we go again. In this case, um, we're looking at the trait right here. Whoops, let me move that back. Get my pen going here. So you look at it, the trait where the population, again, is in that general uh, shape curve. So if it's directional selection, you can see that the trait has moved in one direction. Okay, where the normal now has moved, shifted over, moved over, to over in this case to the right. Um, if it's stabilizing, you're going to remove the extreme. So if you have your population like that, you're going to remove the extremes and you can see the selective pressure on the two sides where your new population now becomes more stable and more similar. And then, of course, you have the disruptive where you have the selective pressure on the center. Okay, In this case, you have the selective pressures on the sides. All right, But in this one, you have it in the center. And now you end up changing your shape so that you are going towards two more distinctive populations on the extreme trait. All right, see, lots of fun. We're going real well, and we're going to keep going. Uh, there's another graph or a series of graphs that are shown, which is the same thing. Uh, you could take a look at this if you want to go back and review it. Hopefully, it'll give you some idea. The only thing with, with this particular one, um, it gives you the concept of fitness, uh, which we talked about in a previous lecture, the ability of a species to reproduce and survive. And the in case of the stabilizing selection, the fittest are right there, directional. Okay, you can see the fitness is shifted to the left. Disruptive, the more common phenotype here, is not um, as fit as the extremes. Okay, you can see the more extreme, in this case, the more extreme is the one that's fit. Okay, and so it's just another way of looking at it. And feel free to go back and look at that and try to get some common understanding of the different uh, types. So now let's take a look at an example. And the famous example is the peppered moth in Europe. Okay, In this particular case, um, you have a species of moth that was a very light colored peppered moth. And the reason for that was that moths um, sleep during the day and come out at night. And so during the day, they have to hide from birds that would eat them. And the particular moth was speckled color because that moth was able to go up against birch trees and other trees that were similar in color and was camouflaged. And birds couldn't find them, so you survived if you were white with some black speckles on it. Well, during the Industrial Revolution and lots of smog and pollution came, the trees became coated with uh, soot, and that soot was dark in color. The peppered moth um, was now exposed, and so if you had the phenotype of white with black speckles, you stood out. So if you had this look, you stood out, and if you were darker colored, you were able to hide better. And that then had the uh, moth population actually change color. As the pollution was reduced, as laws came into effect, uh, reducing the amount of soot being put into the atmosphere, the trees were cleaned, the trees went back to their more original color, and the pepper moth shifted back to more white speckled. So all about survival. Um, and then same thing at the bottom, a great example, is if this particular bird down here had a choice of bugs to eat, it's going to pick out the ones that they can find the easiest, that usually the darker or the larger, those are the ones that are going to be removed from your gene pool and you're going to have natural selection take place. Okay. Hopefully that gives you a slightly better ex understanding. I don't know if I helped much, but hopefully I helped a little bit on that. So we're going to move along a little bit here. And we'll skip that one slide and go right to this process called speciation. When you have disruptive natural selection, you have the opportunity to create a new species. And we call that process speciation. All right. So when we talk about speciation, 
we are talking now about creating a new species. New species. That's what we're talking about here. All right. So we're going to go with a new species. So how does this happen? Well, it happens in two different ways. All right. All right. I'm running. I don't have a lot of room on this slide, so the allopatric technique. Okay, allopatric means that there's some type of isolation between the species, um, where you create a difference. In this case, the fox population. All right, there was a subpopulation that was all the same. Then you had some kind of stress, some kind of selective pressure that pushed it in two different directions. And then if they became geographically isolated from each other and no longer could uh, mate with each other, then you end up with two different species. One was darker, as the gray fox, and the one which was white, the arctic fox. And that's the process of speciation. Allopatric means that they were geographically isolated and reproductively isolated. Okay, And that gives us a real good idea of this process called allopatric uh, speciation. And if it helps, um, just a real good graph. Here you go. There's a great example of geographic isolation. All right, and what you have is they become isolated, in this case by a stream. They begin to go through their own process of uh, fitness where certain traits continue. On this side, you've got your unicorns, and on this side, you've got your regular horses. And they no longer can mate, and there's two new species, therefore it's speciation. This process is called macroevolution. Okay, where you have speciation occurring, it's called macroevolution, and macroevolution means that it's evolution that occurs on a bigger scale in which you actually create a new species, or if it's not a new species, it could be a new classification of the species, a new class, a family, a phyla. All right, the, the, t the taxonomy changes. All right, that's macroevolution on a larger scale, and that's what we're talking about natural selection and speciation. It's called macroevolution. All right, where you're changing within a species called microevolution. The uh, other type of speciation is a little bit different. Um, by the way, allopatric is the most common by far. Um, but the other one becomes very useful to us. And I, I use the example of wheat here because I think it's the great example. All right, and this one is called sympatric. Uh, speciation speciation all right and here's where it gets interesting okay sympatric speciation is where they're not geographically isolated but instead it uses the concept uh, which maybe you heard about in biology Polyploidy. Okay, as you know, most uh, chromosomes are diploid, which means they come in pairs. But if you can add another chromosome and have three, you're called polyploidy instead of diploid. Okay, um, polyploidy now allows an extra set of uh, chromosomes, and you can have three, four, five, six, is up to whatever you want. And this is used a lot in crops to create better crops, I guess. So if you look at wheat as a great example, um, your regular wheat, your native wheat, through our work um, creating a new species, we ended up with an, a second type of wheat, which we used to make things like pasta and stuff like that. And what we did was it, we created a wheat with an extra chromosome in it. And then if you add another chromosome, um, and up to six chromosomes in total, you get common wheat, which we use to make bread um, and stuff like, well, mostly bread. Um, and that whole thing 
um, is this whole concept of sympatric speciation because now they are different species and they do not and they cannot interbreed with each other. They are now different species. We've done this with strawberries, with bananas, with all kinds of crops. Okay, so sympatric speciation means creating new species which, without that geographic isolation. And we are good to go. All right.